Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. The drone section of the Transport Canada AIM document was updated in March of 2022, and there are a number of important changes you should be aware of, especially new procedures when operating near aerodromes. And I'm sorry I'm reporting these changes here so long after the publication of the document. It has required a lot of back and forth with both Transport Canada and Nav Canada to get the proper interpretation and clarifications. Anyways, let's get into it. The Aeronautical Information Manual, or AIM document, is a fantastic reference for all pilots, whether you're flying an Airbus or an Air 2S. It is comprehensive in its breadth, yet at the same time remarkably comprehensible. The AIM is updated twice a year with changes conveniently highlighted with blue backdrops. It provides understandable interpretations of the Canadian aviation regulations, including those applicable to drones. The drone chapter is only 33 pages long and highly recommended reading. In this video, I'll focus on a few key changes, but I encourage you to read this whole thing yourself. There's a link to the document in the description below the video. And hey, while you're down there, make sure you're subscribed to my channel and hit that bell to receive notifications of new videos I put out. Let's start with a change for drones below 250 grams. And before I get into the details, a quick word on my slide format. What I've done on, well, most of the charts is to put the old text from the old version of the AIM on the left under the gray box saying AIM 2021-2. On the right hand side, I've put the new text under the blue AIM 2022-1 banner and put a red box around the key changes. Again, I encourage you to download and read the whole thing yourself to ensure you understand the context of these changes. Okay, onwards. You may recall I published a video about all the hoops you have to jump through to use a DJI Mini at a flight review. You had to add weight to it and get it registered and go through all sorts of things. One thing they had said in the previous version of the AIM is that you needed to deregister your drone if you took stuff off of it such that it was back under 250 grams. Well, they seem to have reconsidered this deregistration requirement. Now it says that once you have registered a, I'll call it a beefed up mini drone, if you remove payload such that it is back under 250 grams, it is automatically considered no longer registered. And if you add weight again, its registration is automatically restored. Thank you, Transport Canada. This is a good move. That said, TC, why not take the next logical step and allow any size drone to be used at a flight review? After all, a flight review is supposed to be a test of the pilot, not of the drone. The only thing stopping you, as far as I can tell, is one line in the flight review guidelines that says that the registration number has to be entered in the drone management portal. I'm sure there's an easy way around this little step. Okay, the second important update is in the right of way section, and it's pretty interesting. They've added a clarifying comment about yielding to what they are, well, what they're now calling traditional aircraft. I think they mean manned aircraft. Now it is not enough to ensure you avoid a collision, but it is also required that you avoid any risk of conflict. And if there is a risk of conflict, you are expected, well, to get the heck out of the way, as expected. And by the way, they've added this notion of conflict to the fines and penalty section as well. Now, I'm not sure what inspired them to add this additional nuance, but it makes sense and is a good thing to keep in mind. The third important change is really just a correction. They have finally fixed the I am safe checklist. So we are now allowed to fly without being tired and hungry. I mentioned this in a video two and a half years ago, and I'm so glad it's finally fixed. The next update is the addition of a very complex diagram accompanied by a video posted on the drone safety website that talks about all the crazy wind conditions you can expect in close proximity to buildings in an urban environment. And they've created this great mnemonic to help you remember them all. SDSTV and icing makes a great jingle. Okay, seriously, somebody did 
actually a terrific job documenting this little well, science experiment perhaps and explaining it all in the video. It's really well done. But that said, I don't think we need to know all this detail. It's interesting, but isn't it enough to know that you could encounter crazy wind gusts and vortex conditions around buildings when it's windy? And if you're going to fly in a city, try to do it when it's calm? Done. And perhaps it's even more important to mention that radio interference in cities increases the risk that you'll lose connection with your drone. Okay, enough about that. Let's get into the last change I want to highlight, and it's really, really important, affecting both basic and advanced pilots. They've significantly changed the protocol, once again, when flying in the vicinity of aerodromes, whether that be military, certified, registered, or even the unregistered guy on the other side of the lake with a seaplane. So first let's read the details of what they've changed and then I'll provide a summary at the end. The changes are in two separate sections, 3.2.35 applicable to all drone pilots and 3.4.5 for advanced pilots. In the first chunk, they've added two paragraphs. The first one reads, when operating an RPA in the vicinity of an aerodrome, water aerodrome, airport, or heliport, the RPA pilot should contact the aerodrome operator to inform them of the RPAS operation, regardless of whether the RPA is in controlled or uncontrolled airspace. Let's make sure we understand what they're asking here. First, they refer to all manner of aerodromes, from an unregistered grassy strip or seaplane guy, all the way up to an international airport. In any of these cases, we should contact the aerodrome operator if we're flying in the vicinity. We better talk about the word should versus the word shall. The word should, according to the AIM, means that TC is encouraging us to follow the stated procedure, but it's not mandatory. The term shall, on the other hand, means that the statement is mandatory, supported by regulations, and quite likely carries consequences such as fines. So with this new statement, we are encouraged to contact aerodromes we are flying near. And of course, near is defined the usual way. For military aerodromes, three nautical miles, certified aerodromes, well, three nautical miles for airports, and one nautical mile for heliports. But near is not actually defined for registered or unregistered aerodromes. So this statement, in my mind, is not very helpful. The should part makes it optional but encouraged, and the vicinity reference is undefined in what in reality is the majority of cases. Okay, let's look at the other new paragraph. And again, this applies to both basic and advanced pilots. The RPA pilot should also maintain a listening watch of the applicable aerodrome traffic frequency, blah, 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 and must hold a Rock A radio certificate. Okay, so here's the should word again. So basically they are encouraging us to listen on the aviation radio band when we're flying in the vicinity of aerodromes. Again, of all shapes and sizes. To round this off, let's move on to section 3.4.5, discussing advanced operations near aerodromes. First, they've chucked out all the stuff they added a year ago about initiating a position report on the radio if you can't contact the airport. That's all gone now. Instead, we find the same two paragraphs repeated about contacting the aerodrome and just listening on the radio. In addition, though, there is a third paragraph that says, check the pro section of the CFS listing for the aerodrome for any RPAS-related procedures. Well, this sounds kind of sensible, except there are no, zero, CFS listings with any such procedures, at least at this time. In fact, there's only one reference to RPAS or drone in the entire CFS library. I checked. And it's just a caution that says, there is occasional drone activity below 400 feet southwest of the CNU-8 aerodrome. So why are they encouraging us to check the pro, or which is the procedure section of the CFS, when there's nothing there? Confused yet? 
Well, I certainly was. So I put together this nice little table. I wish I had done it years ago. It makes things really clear. Now, this version of the table describes the old protocols, but it's important to cover this so we can better understand what has changed. There are basically three kinds of airspace. Controlled airspace on this top row, class F restricted zones in the middle, and then I've lumped class G airspace and CYA advisory zones together in this bottom row. In terms of permissions, you need NAV Canada approval for controlled airspace, the controlling agency for class F restricted areas, for example, the warden of a prison, and well, nothing for class G. Flying near a military base needs an SFOC. And then things get a bit tricky around certified airports and heliports. It used to say quite explicitly that NAV Canada would coordinate with these aerodromes if they were in controlled airspace as part of your flight authorization request. And then you needed to contact the airport and heliport directly only if it was not in controlled airspace. And for the other aerodromes registered and anything else, you didn't need to do anything special. Just stay out of the way of manned aircraft. Okay, got it? Let's look at what the protocols are now. All this stuff over on the left stays the same. But now, regardless of the class of aerodrome, including unregistered grassy strips and the guy on the other side of the lake, you should contact the operator and coordinate your flight with them. And you should check the CFS for potential drone procedures. And you should listen on an aviation radio. Sure, this is a lot simpler to remember now, but it also puts even more onus on the drone pilot to be calling all over the place before flying our drones. And seems to be once again raising the expectation that we have access to fairly expensive aviation radios. So I questioned Transport Canada on this, basically asking if the new wording was just a mistake, which would have been forgivable, of course, or was it a deliberate change? I also asked a senior NAV Canada employee if NAV Canada was aware of these changes. Well, Transport Canada stated that it was in fact a deliberate change, but seemed to agree that it may not be clear because they said the next AIM document would include an additional clarification, which they said was, would be something like this, that the pilot should contact the aerodrome only if there is any chance of interfering with traditional aircraft operations. I suppose this is more sensible guidance, but six months and the full summer will pass before the next edition of the AIM comes out. I asked for the preliminary text so I could share it with you guys in advance, but they didn't send it to me, at least not yet. NAV Canada did confirm that they were involved in this update, but also pointed out that in the past they did not, in general, coordinate with affected aerodromes, as had been stated in the previous versions of the AIM. And this new update actually helps to clarify the recommended procedure. I would be very interested in hearing your own experience with contacting aerodromes and your thoughts on these recent updates to the AIM. Myself, I think this whole business of flying near aerodromes is one of the most important elements of drone regulations and safe drone flight. And I find it so disappointing that the guidelines are still unclear and are churning underneath us every six months. And by the way, we held a Drone Pilot Association of Canada steering committee meeting a few days ago and had quite a lengthy discussion on this exact topic. Anyways, I've droned on a bit long today, so let's leave it at that. Hope you found this summary of the changes and updates in the RPAS section of the AIM interesting and informative. Please do take the time to read the chapter yourself. And as always, thanks for watching. Safe and happy flying.